came here just for this event. They don't have this in Chicago? They do, but it's not this. You come here for the experience. This is like, you know, my father went to Woodstock. This is our Woodstock of a generation. I want to play it at midnight tonight. I think I can't have playing that whole day. I only have three hours of sleep today. Yeah, you go get my dad. I don't even think. Yeah, you go get your dad. I want you to think for a second. Think of video games. You're probably interested in them or have them involved in your life in some way if you're watching this, you maybe even indulge in them. Now I want you to narrow this down. Think of the first person shooter genre and think of the first game or franchise that maybe comes to mind for you. Is it Call of Duty with its annual action-packed enjoyment that it tends to bring each year? Is it Battlefield with its large-scale open-ended multiplayer battles? Is it Doom, the franchise that quite literally popularized the genre and is still going today by doing a good job of appealing to modern audiences while still satisfying the old ones? Is it Ubisoft with Rainbow Six Siege and that game's lightning in a bottle success? Or maybe is it Halo, the franchise that helped bring first-person shooters to more mainstream audiences and also popularize the genre to a console market? The Halo franchise has been around almost 20 years and it's been very successful, but it's also had its very fair share of changes and ups and downs. No matter the perception or opinion you have of the franchise, the games are very well known and respected and with good reason. With Halo having been around as long as it has, the franchise is absolutely legendary, no pun intended, and it's been there for a lot of people a lot of different points in time. Whether you're a longtime fan of the franchise or a newcomer, the series has always been very welcoming across all time, and that's what this video is going to be focusing on time and how the franchise has changed across it. This video will be focusing on how Halo changed from the beginning up until now, and with Halo Infinite on the horizon, I figured it was the perfect time to look back at that. Hope you enjoy this retrospective of the entire Halo franchise. Our story first begins in 1991. Nirvana is absolutely killing it with their breakout album Nevermind. The film industry is booming with films like Terminator 2. The gaming industry is really starting to take off with games like Sonic the Hedgehog and Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, and Bungie Incorporated is founded in Chicago, Illinois by Jason Jones and Alex Seropian. The first game they made was called Pathways into Darkness, released in 1993 on the Apple Macintosh and inspired by the success of id Software's Wolfenstein 3D, becoming a niche critical success for its time. Shortly after Pathways into Darkness in 1994, Bungie intended to make a sequel, but the sequel eventually evolved into Marathon, its own IP which did even better and was generally a better game. Marathon received its own sequel, Marathon 2 Durandal released in 1995, and Marathon Infinity released in 1996. After the Marathon trilogy, Bungie moved away from shooters to develop and release Myth the Fallen Lords in 1997, an RTS that would pave the way for the game design layout of their future projects. Myth was also a critical and commercial success upon its release, receiving universal acclaim from pretty much everybody to play it, with PC Gamer giving it their 1997 RTS Game of the Year award, as well as it being the game that pretty much put Bungie on the map. Myth set up a sequel, Myth 2, and also allowed Bungie to branch out their studio and set up locations and offices outside of Chicago and places like San Jose. They also developed a third-person action game named Oni, although it wouldn't be released for another couple years. However, the really big, big things for Bungie started happening in 1999 when they announced their next project, Halo. Halo was initially supposed to be an RTS that took heavy influences from the Myth games, Bungie's previous project, but evolved into a third-person shooter, which is what it was when they first showed it off. The game was officially revealed with an announcement trailer led by Steve Jobs of all people at the Macworld Expo in 1999. Back when the demo first happened, pretty much everybody who saw it was impressed, and numerous publishing teams afterwards started reaching out to Bungie in hopes of starting talks with them. And that's where a certain somebody comes in. By 2000, Microsoft was a very well-established company, having racked up millions of dollars out of hardware and computers, but they were also looking at sticking their head in the gaming industry at this time with the original Xbox. But with the PlayStation 2 having been released that same year and the Nintendo GameCube coming the next, Microsoft knew they needed a killer app if they wanted the Xbox to sell and be able to compete with either of them. And so because of this, Microsoft reached out to Bungie and talks began between the two. It's important to bear in mind that this wasn't the first time a major publisher had reached out to Bungie requesting to buy them out, seeing as Jason Jones recalls that Activision reached out to them before they even released Marathon, but that was when the studios was light years less experienced. Eventually, the offer was accepted for Microsoft to buy out Bungie, 
and on June 19, 2000, the announcement came that Microsoft had done the job and that Halo would be a launch title for the Xbox under its new name, Halo Combat Evolved, but a few changes would be set in motion. First off, the publishing rights to the Myth and Oni IPs were transferred to Take-Two Interactive, but Microsoft and Bungie both also wanted the game to appeal to more people. Because of this, Halo turned from a third-person shooter to a first-person shooter. First-person shooters were on the rise throughout the 1990s. Despite Bungie's own marathon trilogy, you also had the constant rise of its contemporaries such as Doom, Wolfenstein, Duke Nukem, Blood, Half-Life, Counter-Strike, Rainbow Six, among so many others. What was arguably most notable about all of these is the fact that they were very much dominant to the PC platform and made for being played on PC. While console versions for most of these games exist, they were meant for being played on PC. There were exceptions to this rule, such as Perfect Dark and GoldenEye 007, but they were exactly that. Exceptions. Bungie really wanted to make a first-person shooter feel as good on a controller as it would on a mouse and keyboard, and function as well on the Xbox as it would on a PC. It's also worth pointing out a little bit of trivia about Combat Evolved from before its release, such as the fact that Marty O'Donnell came up with a theme song almost immediately, Master Chief's name wasn't decided on until after the original trailer when he was simply going by the cyborg and also having a vastly different voice actor as opposed to the actual games where he's been voiced by Steve Downs for almost 20 years. Recon reporting. Hostiles have been neutralized. Say again? Over. The drop zone is clear. I repeat, the drop zone is clear. Sleep well? No thanks to your driving, yes. He sounds so different, what the fuck? What's also worth talking about with Combat Evolved is the fact that the game was originally supposed to have a much more open world setting vibe to it, which explains why so many of the game's levels are very open and explorable. Eventually, the game had a full-on demo a few months ahead of its release at GameStock 2001. The demo received a well-rounded response from critics, but several were unimpressed, especially given the move from its initial platform to the Xbox and its many design shifts since then. There was more shown for Combat Evolved at E3 2001, but the reception shown for that material was far more lukewarm, with the game being shown off in a more unstable state, evident by issues of frame rate and other technical problems. Bungie was in trouble and so was Microsoft. Halo was Microsoft's only true hope for the Xbox to launch in a state to compete with Sony and the PlayStation 2. It also didn't help that Oni, Bungie's previous IP before being purchased by Microsoft, released the same year to mixed reviews. Halo was even divisive between Microsoft itself as well in its development, particularly with the name. The subtitle to the name, which we all know now as Combat Evolved, was in forced by Microsoft as a way to market the game better in its competition to other first-person shooters. A few weeks before the game's release, they released Halo The Fall of Reach, a novel which further expanded upon Halo's lore, which was the first sign of many that Halo was intended to be a long-lasting brand. Which is weird, because throughout a lot of the research I did, it's very clear that Halo was never intended to be a franchise or a trilogy or anything like that, so this sort of got shat out and ended up being really good. The game finally ended up coming together in its final months of development, with eventually Halo Combat Evolved being at last released alongside the launch of the Xbox on November 15, 2001 to universal acclaim and is credited to this day as one of the greatest games of all time. It's also frequently credited to this day as the game that pretty much helped push FPS games on console to the forefront. GameSpot's initial review from when the game initially came out stated, not only is it the best of the Xbox's launch titles, but easily one of the best shooters on any platform ever. As well as IGN saying, you think you know, but you have no idea how great this game is as well as also crediting the story for being good enough for a full-length novel and praising the visual and audio design. To this very day, Metacritic considers it to be one of the greatest games of all time, with the critic score currently sitting in a 97 and being placed 15th on their list of greatest games of all time as I'm writing this down. The single-player campaign was pretty much universally praised by everybody that played it for its intricate level design, revolutionary AI, balanced weapons, combat, and engaging story, as well as a phenomenal soundtrack composed by Marty O'Donnell and spectacular animation cutscenes for its time. According to Jason Jones in the developer commentary walkthrough of the game, the Pillar of Autumn as shown in the opening cutscene was entirely built by lead environmental art designer Paul Russell in just four minutes, and also Joe Staten adds on by saying that the Pillar of Autumn itself never actually moves, but instead is just a static object that the environment itself moves around. The really funny part about all this stuff with the Pillar of Autumn it's isn't funny. all of these shots... Is that Paul Russell built it in like four minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, is that the Pillar of Autumn never moves. Right. Uh, in this cinematic and other cinematics, it's just a piece of BSP geometry that the camera always moves around. So 
to simulate movement. Oh my god, it's Captain <laughs> Keys. <laughs> Look at Captain you had to do some crazy stuff. Multiplayer was also a planned addition and was in the game, but only in the form of split screen and system links between multiple Xbox consoles. Online multiplayer was cut from the game and its development due to Xbox's limitations at the time. Online multiplayer on console was still a fairly foreign concept at this point. Later versions of the game to be released, such as the MCC version, would include online multiplayer, but the original version for the game on the original Xbox still had it notably absent, despite its original intentions to be in the game. There are even people out there that think Combat Evolved is a genuinely flawless game game even almost 20 years later, but even for all of Combat Evolve's many triumphs, it wasn't a flawless game, it was far from it. I guess this is a good segue into me talking about my issues with this game despite how much I love it, so here we go. To start off, the unbalancing of the pistol, especially on the original version, the pistol is immeasurably unbalanced. Even on Legendary, it only takes a couple shots to kill a hunter and tends to make other weapons such as the Needler and Assault Rifle feel ineffective. The Library. Fuck this mission. The library is one of the worst Halo levels of all time. It's a repetitive mess of a level, and it's often poked fun at and memed at by the community and fanbase. It's also worth pointing out how laughably terrible Combat Evolved's vehicle physics are, even for the standards of a 2001 game. You'll attempt to make the slightest turn, and all of a sudden your warthog is trying to drift in 85 billion different directions. This probably wouldn't bother me nearly as much if riding around in vehicles wasn't such a huge chunk of the gameplay in most of the missions. Those are all my main problems with this game, as well as a few other nitpicks that I didn't mention. In complete seriousness, Halo Combat Evolved is often considered one of the greatest games of all time and one of the greatest shooters of all time, and with good reason. It's a spectacular game. You can very much tell the influence from games like Doom and Half-Life, as well as Bungie taking a page out of their own book with some influence from the Marathon trilogy, as is evident with a lot of the mechanics and stylistic choices. With the game's release in 2001, compared to now almost 20 years later, the game still holds up in the eyes of many and is still one of the greatest first-person shooters as well as just games in general of all time. It also came out in what I consider to be the greatest year in gaming history as far as releases go, 2001. Because 2001 was absolutely maniacal when it came to new releases. You had Rockstar pushing the boundaries of 3D open world games and environments with Grand Theft Auto 3, Konami was at their arguable peak in quality with Silent Hill 2 and Metal Gear Solid 2, Nintendo was popping off with the release of the GameCube as well as games like Luigi's Mansion and Smash Bros. Melee, Sega was enjoying their final moments in the console industry with Sonic Adventure 2, PC gamers were enjoying Civilization 3 and Clive Baker's Undying, so much was going on, and even throughout all of this and the absolutely insane amount of quality or revolutionary games to be released in 2001, Halo Combat Evolved, a launch title on a console nobody knew would succeed or fail, ended up being one of the best games of the year, as well as one of the best shooters ever in history on any platform. Halo was never planned to be a huge brand that would still be well known almost 20 years after it was initially kicked off, but the huge success of Combat Evolved as well as the Xbox itself made another game pretty much inevitable, so a sequel to Combat Evolved started production pretty quickly. It's even rumored that pre-production on the next game started as early as late 2001. Given how successful Combat Evolved actually was, as well as the Xbox itself, all eyes were on Microsoft and Bungie at this point for the sequel to Combat Evolved, and regardless of its quality, it would succeed nonetheless. Bungie could really do no wrong financially, but they could in quality, and that's why they wanted to perfect this game. Immediately after the release of Combat Evolved in 2001, the team at Bungie primarily wanted the sequel to express the ideas that developers had for the first game that were never able to make it in. They also wanted to make it a more well-rounded and content-rich game overall, as well as further working on Halo's style. Combat Evolved very much established it, but Bungie wanted to develop it a lot more with the sequel. Many people already expected Bungie by this point to make a Halo sequel, considering the success of the original, and so it E3 2002, eight months after Combat Evolve's release, James Allard, who was Xbox's general manager at the time, confirmed that Halo 2 was in development and hoped for a release around the time of late 2003, but it wouldn't be that easy. Halo 2's rough development is pretty well documented at this point across multiple different areas. A large portion of the research for this section of the video I did was taken from the official Viduc, or video documentation that Bungie did directly for Halo 2 ahead of its release, which I highly recommend you watch if you're more interested in this game's development beyond what I say in this video. One of the 
biggest issues and roadblocks in the game's development was the fact that while there were definitely people that were passionate about the project and wanted to work on it, there were also a large amount of people that didn't, and many of those people were key figures in the development and the success of Combat Evolved. For example, Alex Seropian, Bungie's co-founder that helped work on Combat Evolved, as well as Myth, Marathon, Pathways into Darkness, and everything else up to that point, just straight up left the company in 2002. Add to this the fact that Halo 2 would be a complete technical overhaul in pretty much every way from Combat Evolved, with Bungie completely rebuilding the game engine from the ground up, altering the physics engine to add room for things not previously present like ragdoll physics, and making a completely new graphics engine from the ground up. However, while this was all well and good, it was digging Bungie a hole that they weren't exactly hoping for, and it became abundantly clear that the game wouldn't be meeting its holidays 2003 release date. Bungie also wanted the story for Halo 2 to be more fleshed out and darker than its predecessor. Joe Staten and Jamie Griesemer also discussed telling the story from both UNSC and Covenant perspectives, which would also make it into the game, with a Covenant character named Dervish, which became the arbiter late into the game's development. The reason for the name change was actually enforced by Microsoft, because they actually thought the name Dervish would be perceived as them sending a message to Islam, especially when the Middle East didn't exactly have a good relationship with the US at this time. Eventually, Bungie started constructing the initial demo build in February of 2003 to show off to the public. The demo was complete and showed off to the public at E3 2003. What you good people are about to see is an operation in progress. This is a real-time feed. No smoke and mirrors pre-recorded bullshit. <laughs> It showcased new enemies, abilities, and features that weren't present in Combat Evolved, such as dual wielding. But while the demo was generally well received by fans, Bungie themselves had a massive problem and were super anxious about it. Several of the features shown in the E3 demo weren't stable or game ready enough to be sold on a finished product, as well as the fact that they were using a faulty graphics engine. According to Jamie Griesemer, the graphics engine that was used in the E3 2003 demo build of Halo 2 had to be entirely scrapped and rebuilt again from the ground up in a very short amount of time which very much took a mental toll on the developers. In order to ship the game on time, Bungie had to downsize the game significantly in terms of both single player and multiplayer. The original concept of Halo 2's campaign was that it was actually supposed to be a lot longer and include both Halo 2 and 3's stories together, but Bungie eventually cut it in half to save time and a budget. It's also worth mentioning that up to this point, Halo 2 was the most hyped game of all time. Pre-orders were selling out a record 1.5 million before the game even came out. Places like GameStop and EB Games had hundreds of people people coming in every day to place a pre-order, it got mainstream attention to even being mentioned by people like Jimmy Kimmel and GMA, it was literally even drawing attention away from the actual fucking 2004 US presidential election, that's fucking insane. <laughs> All of this only put a lot more pressure on Bungie to complete the game on time, as well as Microsoft wanting the online multiplayer for Halo 2 to be a system seller for their Xbox Live brand which had launched in late 2002. Bungie had also shelved every other project they were working on at the time including a new IP of theirs called Phoenix to ensure Halo 2's completion. Microsoft had made sure Bungie knew that delaying the game another holiday season wasn't an option, and so the entirety of 2004 was just one giant period of crunch. By this point, Halo was a well-established brand due to the success of Combat Evolved and unmatched hype for the sequel. Even despite other anticipated releases coming out around this time, like GTA San Andreas, Half-Life 2, and Metal Gear Solid 3, Halo 2 was the most anticipated form of general entertainment of all time heading up to its release by this point. Even beating out things nobody could have ever thought to be topped in terms of hype like Return of the Jedi, The Phantom Menace, Ocarina of Time, and the PlayStation 2 itself. It also even got promotion in movie theater previews, making it the first game to ever be promoted to that level, and even now you don't see that very much. This transitions me nicely into my next point, which will be me talking about I Love Bees. Now for those of you watching who are possibly less knowledgeable about Halo and don't know what the fuck I Love Bees is, sit down, let me tell you a story. So a Essentially, I Love Bees was an ARG, or alternate reality game, that served as one of Halo 2's core marketing strategies in 2004 and the final months leading up to its release, and I personally think it was one of the most clever marketing strategies I've ever seen for anything. It was an ARG that gave players around the world certain coordinates which would lead them to payphones. In these payphones, the people ringing them could humorously interact with some of the characters from the game, and it all culminated with the program inviting a very select amount of players to one of four different cinemas across the world where they could play Halo 2 early. It was a bizarre yet extremely creative way to market the game. The game was finally coming together in the final months of development, even despite a year of crunch, creative differences, tension between developers, and an estimated budget of 20 million fucking dollars, the game was finally getting to the point where Bungie could genuinely say it was finished. All people had to do now was wait. 
wait until the hype had continuously circled up over and over and over again with the game's hype over the past three years, and then it happened. Halo 2 was officially released for the original Xbox on November 9, 2004 to widespread acclaim and admiration. Metacritic gave it a 95, which wasn't quite as good as the original despite coming very close, with IGN giving it a 9.8, very close to a 10. GameSpot gave it a 9.4, praising it for its thrilling action, but criticizing it for what they considered to be a disappointing storyline and campaign. Undeniably, the biggest new introduction from Halo 2 was actual online multiplayer, which, as I've already established, wasn't present in the original Xbox version of Combat Evolved. Even though the 2003 PC port of Combat Evolved by Gearbox Software had the online features the original Xbox version lacked, not as many people played it, and the Xbox version dominated the sales, making Halo 2 the first time online multiplayer would be fully functional in a Halo game to such a mainstream audience. To this day, Halo 2's multiplayer is very highly praised, and with good reason. It's very good for several reasons. To start off, the game launched with 12 multiplayer maps, which we take for granted now, but for its time, it's a really good number. While some maps like Beaver Creek and Warlock lacked in quality, it had a significant amount of really good maps too, like Lockout and Zanzibar. It also helped that Bungie made weapon balancing significantly better in Halo 2 compared to how it was in Combat Evolved. Removing the assault rifle from the game entirely and dumbing down the pistol a significant amount to make sure weapons like the shotgun and rocket launcher were more evenly balanced and actually used, as well as the addition of weapons like the SMG and the battle rifle. The SMG basically took the place of the assault rifle in Halo 2, which was absent, as I had just established, and the battle rifle was a precision-based three-round burst rifle, used mostly for long-range encounters. The pistol, as I said, was substantially worse in Halo 2, which was honestly for the best. I would even go as far as to say, depending how you looked at it, the pistol in Combat Evolved completely broke the entire balancing of the game in general. That's not the case in Halo 2, and I'm glad to say that the balancing overall, not only as far as weapons go, but as far as everything else goes too, is much better in this game. The Combat Evolved pistol might even be the most overpowered handgun in FPS history. In Combat Evolved, it was a pistol, but also a precision-based one-shot that could essentially be used as a long-range sniper just as adequately as it could be used a pistol, or a point-blank based shotgun. In Halo 2, it does its job and nothing more, and the balancing as a whole is a lot better because of that. Halo 2 is the game where the battle rifle, sniper rifle, and needler, as well as button combos for melee attacks, reign supreme. Another thing that made Halo 2 multiplayer so unique and appealing was the fact that this was most people's first true experience with Xbox Live and with some people just online multiplayer in general. Obviously back in 2004, this was more of a luxury than a necessity and the Xbox Series X has online as a primary focus in the same way Microsoft has for years now, but back then this was a new and exciting thing. Sure, other games on the original Xbox like Return to Castle Wolfenstein and Burnout 3 had already utilized Xbox Live as a service by this point, but Halo 2 was the first game to ever do it to such a scale. Halo 2 multiplayer established a new era for online gaming in general, which players everywhere wholeheartedly respect. As for Halo 2's campaign, I think there's a lot to be said with that too. Some good, some bad, some in between. The story itself, I would say, is really good, and a vast improvement upon Combat Evolved's story. Not to say that Combat Evolved's story was bad by any means, but rather the fact that Halo 2 expanded the story and the universe, making Combat Evolved's rather simplistic roots and humble beginnings feel inferior in comparison. The plot of Halo 2 is that after the events of Combat Evolved's ending where you blow up a Halo ring, the Covenant X Exile, Thelvatim, or better known as the Arbiter, for failing to stop the UNSC, is sentenced to death. But he gets out of it, and the game has you play from both the perspectives of Master Chief and the UNSC as you deal with the Covenant's counterplot, and the Arbiter trying to escape the clutches of the Covenant and the Three Prophets, which makes for a far more interesting story dynamic now that you see both sides of the opposing forces and how their relationship with one another develops over the course of the game. Now as far as level design goes, compared to Combat Evolved, I actually think Halo 2 is far worse. Halo 2's level design isn't necessarily bad, but it's it's not exactly the game's strong suit either. In the original, as well as future games, it was far less egregious than it is here. In Combat Evolved, the only dragging repetitive level was the library, where in Halo 2, a lot more levels have that same feeling. Not to the same degree, but they have the same feeling nonetheless. And it also doesn't help if you're playing on Legendary. Halo 2 on Legendary is not something I entirely think I know how to describe, and that comes from somebody who's completed it twice on that difficulty. In Combat Evolved, at least you were frequently supplied with ammo and health packs and enemies that weren't too difficult, it wasn't total bullshit, which is more than I can say for Halo 2. A lot of the previously balanced weapons stop being balanced, the enemy design doesn't help, and the fact that sniper jackals and sword elites are a one-shot horror show whenever you encounter them isn't a good thing. I still think that the mid-level design that Halo 2 has is made up for by its engaging story, but it can't go ignored. In the end, regardless, Halo 2 was a massive success, and with good reason. It's a phenomenal 
small game that made $125 million in its first 24 hours. Bungie had huge ambitions for this behemoth of a franchise, and with a bright horizon, with such a bright horizon, why wouldn't you continue? Halo 2 was a massive success, and to be honest, that's kind of an understatement in itself. It improved upon its predecessor, it broke financial records, it did pretty much everything it needed to do as a sequel, and I think it's fair to call it a massive success. After Halo 2 made box office history with record-breaking sales due to immeasurable hype and award-winning quality, Bungie knew they needed to hold up their end of the bargain with Halo 2's ending to finish the fight. But while production on the third Halo game would very quickly begin as early as late 2004, the extremely turbulent development of Halo 2 had become very emotionally taxing on the people working on it. After Halo 2 shipped in 2004, Jason Jones went on a sabbatical, which really hindered the creative process for a fair amount of time, as well as the fact that Joe Staten went on vacation away from Bungie himself to get away from it for a bit. Bungie also started to become a little disgruntled with Microsoft, considering what they went through back in Halo 2's development to get the game finished on time for its release date under Microsoft's order. Bungie wanted to make a project they had more creative control over, which was also hammered down by the fact that the studio was working with new hardware, seeing as the original Xbox had become outdated to be taken up by the Xbox 360, which would launch in November of 2005. This meant Bungie could work on the next Halo with better hardware, better technology, and generally make the game play better than either Combat Evolved or Halo. Two. Bungie recalls that compared to Halo 2, the development of this game was far more smooth, with more time to put an extra amount of effort. Bungie also mostly kept quiet about this game before they officially announced it, sometimes alluding throughout 2005 to them working on a new project. But while a new IP from the studio was indeed possible, most people generally figured they were working on a new Halo game to finish up the supposed trilogy, with a few big teases here and there. This all culminated at E3 2006, when at Microsoft's press conference, Bungie officially revealed Halo 3 to the public with a cinematic trailer, and fans fucking exploded. Halo 2 was already a gargantuan success in terms of hype and pre-order sales, but Bungie wasn't anywhere near close to ready for what they were about to witness for the pre-release hype of Halo 3. This was something that could honestly be described as genuinely historical. Within the first couple hours of the game's official announcement, the internet exploded, and with good reason. This was one of the first examples of the internet breaking because of a video game. Bungie really went all in with it, and they were far more transparent with the fans in comparison to Halo 2's more quiet development process, which made the impending release that much more exciting for fans. The only games I can think of, if any, that have ever reached or exceeded Halo 3's levels of expectation are Skyrim, GTA 5, and maybe a few others, but Halo 3 was a big fucking deal, I think you get it now. Even if you weren't playing video games, even if you were but didn't care about Microsoft or the Xbox and was more of a PC or a Nintendo or Sony guy, you knew exactly what Halo 3 was and that everybody was hyped out of their fucking minds to play it. Well, it's been a month since video gamers stormed the stores to get their hands on Halo 3. The game was September's top seller with 3.3 million copies flying off the shelves. <laughs> it's exhilarating, man. It's an experience. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Every single day. GameStops, EB Games, Targets, Best Buys, retailers all around the world were absolutely losing their shit with pre-orders for Halo 3. The game's official release was set for 2007 on the Xbox 360, and a multiplayer beta was set to take place four months before release, which ended up being an outstanding success. Bungie's marketing with the game also helped a huge amount. The Believe trailer for Halo 3 to this day is still my favorite trailer of all time for any piece of media that's ever been released, as well as an ad campaign that went by the same name. The Halo 3 Believe ad campaign took some of the Marines from the campaigns in a fictional museum for sit-down interviews, almost like a documentary type thing, and it did a great job showcasing the humanity of the Marines. It did a good job to make them seem like more than the standard NPC you kill to get more AR ammo, and their humanity is interesting, especially when you don't really think about it while you're mowing down a bunch of evil aliens with loads of guns and explosives. It was a lot more emotion than people were typically used to with the Halo franchise back in 2007. Ahead of the game's release, Halo 2 got its own PC port in May 2007 by Hired Gun Studios, which only seemed to enhance the hype for Halo 3, as anything related to the game or franchise in general would at this point. And this all culminated on the night before release in Fall 2007, the midnight release of Halo 3, a night that would go down in history for games and just media 
media in general. I could honestly make an entire video discussing this singular night alone and everything that went down in it and everything that made it so special, but for the sake of your time, I'll try to be somewhat brief about it by mentioning some really cool stuff that happened, so let's get into this. Some guy dressed up as an Xbox 360 and beats up a person dressed up as a PS3. Retail stores have lines that stretch out literal miles. Some of these lines chanted the Halo theme in unison, they have my respect, and then there's this. 12 a.m., September 25th, 2007. Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft, the richest man in the world at that time, worth $56 billion, declares Halo 3 released as he sells the first copy of the game at a Best Buy in Bellevue, Washington. It was so great to see, and even though it happened 13 years ago, I still get goosebumps whenever I watch that video. The anticipation of Halo 3 was absolutely unlike anything anybody had ever seen before, and a large part of me really wishes I was there to see it go down as it was happening. As I stated, Halo 3 was officially released to the public on September 25th, 2007 for the Xbox 360, and there's a lot to go over with it. The reviews were extremely positive, with IGN giving it a 9.5, as well as Eurogamer giving it a 10. To start off talking about the game itself, there's the multiplayer. The multiplayer itself I consider to be the best in the series. The weapons are very balanced, even if weapons like the Assault Rifle are really dependent on certain things to happen at certain points in order to be viable, and the SMG in Halo 3 is a lot better than it was in 2. The Battle Rifle is pretty great too, although they did switch it from hit scan based in Halo 2 to projectile based in Halo 3. It threw a lot of people off at first, but over the years I think it grew on people. The Sniper and the Carbine are probably like the two best weapons, as well as things like the Needler, Spiker, and the Fuel Rod Cannon. The movement is fluid as well, and the game visually still holds up astoundingly well. The maps are great too, there are still a lot of unforgettable classics as far as maps go, like Sand Trap, Sandbox, The Pit, Orbital, Avalanche, so many maps that are super memorable to anybody that picks them up. So many of them are extremely distinct, which is nice. Sand Trap and Sandbox are nice desert-built pyramid-like maps. The Pit is a rusty old warehouse house where snipers lurk, and it's easy to get clapped if you don't know what you're doing or where you're going. Narrows is a larger map with thrusters on both sides that boost you to the other side of the map, and it's insanely fun. These maps are all extremely distinct and diverse from one another, and that's great to see in a game like this. While typical modes in Halo 3 like Slayer and CTF and SWAT were still there, there were also new additions popularized by the community like Duck Hunt and Griffball. Custom games in Halo 3 were just generally better, and also multiplayer itself in all honesty was too. Halo 3 also served as the introduction of Theater Mode, a feature where you could go back and watch your previous matches and then see the highlights and make montages out of it, which is also something that other shooters would soon copy and follow afterward in its footsteps. The campaign is also a pretty big talking point as for Halo 3, there's a lot to go over in terms of it too. In terms of difficulty, it's far more playable than Halo 2 was. The difficulty spike on Legendary was toned down significantly to the point where I would honestly call 3 the easiest in the entire trilogy. The overall level design in 3 is also something I consider to be better than it was in Halo 2. The levels are a lot more coherent and fluid, there's more a sense of what you're doing and what's going on, and I think the levels in 3 are a lot more replayable. The levels are a lot shorter in 3 though, which isn't something that completely bothers me, but I do find it kind of annoying at points. Floodgate is one of my favorite levels in any Halo game, but you could finish the whole thing on Heroic in like 15 minutes. It could have been a lot longer. Where I feel Halo 3 falls flat in comparison to Halo 2 as far as the campaign goes is the story. The story in Halo 3, which is still pretty good, is a bar weaker to its predecessor. Halo 2's campaign had more weight and depth to it. 3 tried to replicate that, but I don't think it did the job as well, even if the story and plot of trying to find Cortana was very interesting. It's still very good, but I still think that Halo 2's campaign, as far as story goes, is better. It gave a fitting end to the original trilogy and the story that Bungie wanted to tell while also leaving room for projects that would come in the future, and above all, it was still fun to play and had some of the best missions in Halo's history. The Ark, Floodgate, and Cortana are all top 10 Halo missions of all time, in my opinion. Apart from the campaign, there was Bungie's new feature with Halo 3, Forge. It was an interesting concept. Essentially, Forge is a mainstay mode in Halo now that was introduced in Halo 3, which was pretty much a map editor, but you could also use it to create entirely new game modes and features with friends to put in custom games. It also served as a great place to make general new experiences out of the game. If what you made in Forge Forge was good enough, you could even make it onto Bungie's favorites on their official website, and also Bungie supplying the game with new stuff like Recon on Hayabusa armor, Halo 3 brought people together more than any other game in the 
series would ever be able to. It united its player base better than most games could ever dream of doing. The way I look at it, the original Halo trilogy all worked to push each other up to that point. Combat Evolved walked so Halo 2 could run and so Halo 3 could fly. Bungie was far more transparent with Halo 3 because they had more of a following. Sure, Halo 2 was huge, but not to this magnitude, especially if you look on YouTube back in the early days of the website. And I'm not talking 2012-2013 classic YouTube, I'm talking classic classic YouTube, like 2007, 2008, and the shit that people were pumping out, the content about this game, this very game, there was so much of it. A lot of content creators that are well known now and well loved now got their lucky start by playing this very game. I'm talking Rooster Teeth, I'm talking Deranker, I'm talking like 90% of people that had contracts with Machinima. This game really helped out a lot of internet content careers. I guess what I'm trying to say more than anything is that Halo 3 exemplified community. It exemplified a fan base more than any game in the series ever would afterward or before. Halo 3 was undeniably the peak of Bungie's success, leaving a lot of people wondering what could be next. This led up to a lot of people being surprised when shortly after Halo 3's release, Bungie split from Microsoft to become their own independent studio on October 1st, 2007, despite the fact that they were still under contract to develop and market another Halo game. In a deal between the two companies, it was specified that Bungie would continue to develop and market the games for a short while longer, but the Halo property was legally in the hands of Microsoft. The main reason for the split was because Bungie was working on a new IP, which would later become widely known to the public as Destiny, and they needed a different company to secure publishing rights. People also got slightly irritated at the company when they released four map packs for Halo 3 in April of 2008, all $10 each, which combined up to $40, if anything, an ironic foreshadowing of the controversy over Destiny's expansion pass. Bungie also wanted to unveil a new project they were working on at E3 2008, but the studio head at the time, Harold Ryan, announced that the unveiling was cancelled. Three months later, in September of 2008, Bungie announced a spin-off called Halo 3 Recon, which was later then changed to Halo 3 ODST, a game they had been working on as a spin-off to Halo 3, which would focus on more squad-based gameplay popularizing games like Ghost Recon and XCOM. On top of this, there was also another Halo-related project that Bungie wasn't developing called Halo Wars, developed by Ensemble Studios, announced way back in late 2007 and marketed throughout 2008 as a Halo-themed RTS, which was poetic given the original intentions of the franchise in the first place. It was a really nice concept, and its main goal was to try and make an RTS feel good on a controller, in the exact same way Combat Evolved had tried to do the same thing with first-person shooters years earlier. Halo Wars was released on February 26, 2009 for Xbox 360 and PC platforms. It received generally favorable reviews from critics and fans, despite not entirely winning over some hardcore fans, which, to be honest, was to be expected. It was an entirely different game than the three that people had come to know by this point. The game was generally praised for its cinematics and mechanics, but criticized for its story and campaign. My take on Halo Wars, and take this with a grain of salt because I'm not generally a huge fan of RTS games, is this. I think it's a well-made game, especially for a secondary studio, and the game mechanics are mostly really nice, but I think the story is underdeveloped and certain things about the game, primarily some animations and bugs, haven't necessarily stood the test of time. Even with the release of Halo Wars, the spin-off game Halo 3 ODST was still being marketed, but before it was released, E3 2009 took place, where Microsoft announced their next major Halo release. Halo Reach. Reach, with a scheduled release for the following year, would be Bungie's last Halo game. It would be a prequel to Combat Evolved and a loose adaptation of the novel Halo The Fall of Reach, which helped appeal to fans of the more expansive side of the franchise and lore. Much like ODST, Reach's gameplay was looking to be far more squad-based rather than the original trilogy's individual run-and-gun style of gameplay. As I previously stated a couple seconds ago, it was also clear to people that Halo Reach would be Bungie's last Halo game before they moved on from the franchise to focus their full attention on Destiny. Shortly after that event, Halo 3 ODST was released on September 22, 2009 for the Xbox 360 to positive reviews and with good reason. The campaign focused on a squad of ODSTs or Orbital Drop Shock Troopers and put the squad function more to use in what was a bit gloomier of a take on the Halo franchise. It wasn't afraid to get a little bit more atmospherically depressing at certain points. The story and characters themselves are distinct and interesting as well. The biggest issue with ODST's campaign was that it was way too short. It's only three to five hours long. If it was a little longer with more missions that potentially introduce more gameplay elements and game mechanics, I'd probably appreciate it a lot more than I already do. I think 
the highlight of ODST is definitely the soundtrack. I love this game's soundtrack so much. Marty O'Donnell took a different turn with the soundtrack in ODST. Instead of the typical soundtrack we were used to from Halo, it took a quieter, more ambient sound, which fits the tone of the game a lot better. Another big feature in ODST was Firefight, a horde mode where a select amount of players defend against waves and waves of Covenant enemies. I loved ODST Firefight because of how vulnerable you feel as a player and working your way up to being better, the progression works out really well. ODST in general worked really well as a spin-off game and it still holds up to this day even if it shouldn't have been $60 at release. Even despite Halo Wars and ODST holding fans over, the hype for Halo Reach continued throughout 2009 and into 2010. This was Bungie's last endeavor with the franchise and the franchise was changing rapidly at this time and it would only change more after they were gone so this better had been a good one. Another thing that solidified this change and will to move on was the fact that on April 15th of 2010, Microsoft permanently shut down the online servers for Xbox Live on the original Xbox, which meant games like Halo 2 could no longer be played online. Bungie ran a multiplayer beta for the game, which was available from May 3rd to May 20th of 2010 for people who owned ODST. Reach's beta was pretty well received, but also had its fair share of complaints from fans. People complained about the pistol or some of the stylistic choices for some of the maps. Even despite the minuscule divide at the time that fans had, they were still super excited to get to play the game and experience Bungie's magic with the Halo franchise one last time. As far as marketing went, Microsoft gave Bungie the largest budget for marketing they had ever given them at all, and it all began in April 2010 with the live-action short titled Birth of a Spartan, as well as a series of videos that would be released that depicted Reach citizens before the arrival of the Covenant, and several TV spots for the game by August. Reach was also running on an entirely new engine to make the gameplay feel better, as well as motion capture. After a year and a half of hype and marketing on Bungie's part, Halo Reach was finally released to the Xbox 360 on September 14, 2010 as Bungie rode off into the sunset to partner with Activision and make Destiny. The game the game upon release was highly praised by critics and also fans of the franchise, but was, at the same time, very divisive. For one, let me go over the game and state my personal opinion on it, especially since I think there's a lot more now that I have to say than I did in the Reach review I did two years ago. Reach's multiplayer in terms of gameplay is far different than Halo 3 was, and there's a lot to go over in terms of that. The maps in Reach felt very Halo-like, with maps like Spire and Boneyard, as well as the weapons with new additions such as the DMR and the Needle Rifle as well as bringing back fan-favorite community content like Griffball. The vehicle controls felt really nice too, but my favorite thing about Reach's multiplayer was its armor customization. I love Reach's armor customization so much, it's so in-depth, it's rewarding to look at, it's nice to look at, uh, the simple amount of choices of in-depth customization for your armor is absolutely staggering. Ugh, it's so good. Where Reach's multiplayer becomes controversial amongst the fanbase starts with Bungie's removal of classic features such as dual wielding and the introduction of armor abilities. For those wondering, armor abilities were basically classes or loadouts, and each one of them had a different special ability, one of which was Sprint, which many people were sour about. Then there was Jetpack, which was pretty self-explanatory. Active Camo was now an armor ability rather than a power-up around the map. There's Drop Shield, which at any point can just deploy you a shield for a few seconds. Hologram, which as is self-explanatory creates a decoy of the player. Evade, which literally allows you to escape enemy fire like a pussy, and then there's everybody's least favorite thing in the whole world, Armor Lock, this absolutely atrocious piece of fucking filth. Essentially, Armor Lock created a shield within the player's armor that could hide them from literally any form of damage at the expense of movement for a few seconds, and as soon as you're done, it lights off this EMP beam. It was so insanely broken. It was slightly toned down on the MCC version of Reach, but on the original version for the 360, it was just mental. And even on MCC, it's still kind of broken. I just find it odd that Bungie did all these things to Reach, like remove dual wielding in order to bring the franchise back to its roots, and then they add things like hologram and armor lock. On the other, more positive hand, the weapon balancing in Reach I actually think is insanely well done. Once again, just like in Halo 2, nearly every weapon feels like it has its place in some way. Outside of multiplayer, there's the campaign, which I personally regard as one of my favorites in the entire series as far as story goes. Just like ODST, it's more centered around you plus your AI teammates as opposed to the original trilogy's more individual-based style of gameplay. The story is absolutely fantastic, 
2, detailing the final days of Reach before the Covenant arrived on the planet, beginning the fall. The story is told from the perspective of Noble Team, a group of elite Spartans that are meant to keep the peace and stop the Covenant from taking over, and the story is told really well. Your playable character, Noble 6, is one character out of others that include Emil, Carter, Kat, George, and June. Each of these characters are distinct from one another, and they all serve a purpose to the story, and spoiler alert, 3, 2, 1, they all die by the end. The final moments of Halo Reach's campaign are pretty iconic, and it paves the way for the events of Combat Evolved to take place. It was a darker, slower, more depressing take on the series throughout its 10-hour runtime, and I'm glad it wasn't afraid to get a little gloomier than the franchise avidly is by providing the message that some soldiers die on the front lines for nobody to remember their names. Reach also has some pretty impressive stuff as far as level design goes too. Tip of the Spear and New Alexandria are some of my favorite missions from the franchise just in general. Apart from the campaign, Halo Reach also heralded the return of Forge from Halo 3, and it still had the exact same qualities as Halo 3 Forge, only held back by the fact that the maps themselves aren't quite as good as 3's. Even besides that, Reach also brought back Firefight from ODST. While Reach Firefight wasn't quite as brutal, I still love it for being just about as fun. As I said, I think it's fair to say that Halo Reach was a fairly divisive game amongst the community. Many highly praised it as Bungie's final effort with the franchise, puns very much intended, while others weren't as kind to it, criticizing it for its inconsistencies as well as many different things that fell short as quality went as well. Upon the game's 2010 release, critics held the game in pretty high regard as new Halo releases were accustomed to by that point. IGN gave the game a verdict of 9.5, stating Halo Reach is a fantastic package and praising it for what they consider to be quality and calling it one of the best shooters of the year, as well as considering it a fitting end to Bungie's involvement with the franchise. GameSpot gave it the exact same verdict, praising the game as far as gameplay went but criticizing the game's UI. The critics all seemed to love it and eat it up, but that's kind of what Halo was accustomed to at that point, and the community seemed to be really torn on it. What I've begun to notice over the course of time is that Halo Reach's flaws have suddenly become a lot more apparent to people, myself included. While I love the game and admit that it holds an incredibly special place in my heart, I admit the game is far from perfect, as well as potentially the furthest from perfect out of all the Bungie games. That's not to say the game is bad, far from it, but things like armor abilities and multiplayer, as well as several inconsistencies in game design, bog it down a peg significantly in comparison to the first three games for me. I noticed that when the game came to MCC, everyone freaked out at first because they remembered how much they loved it and how much nostalgia they had for it, but that quickly went from that to, wow, this is a great game, but this, this, and this are wrong with it. Apart from that, as I've stated, Joe Staten, Jason Jones, Marty O'Donnell, and the rest of Bungie left Halo to go partner with Activision and make Destiny, which was definitely something they had been planning on doing for a while, as is evident in some of their projects. There's actually a Destiny teaser easter egg in ODST which can be found in the level Mombasa Streets. After Bungie's departure from Halo, Microsoft acquired a new studio to begin developing new ones. This studio has gone down in infamy within the community, and they're widely known to Halo fans as 343 Industries. Founded by Bonnie Ross in 2007, in Kirkland, Washington, 343 was adequately named after the character 343 Guilty Spark, who appeared in Combat Evolved, Halo 2, and Halo 3. 343 was responsible for a seven-part anime called Halo Legends, as well as the application called Halo Waypoint, which was a website in 2009 that tracked Halo players' accomplishments and accolades. Though now that they were working on the full games themselves, and also taking the place of Bungie at that, the task at hand was far heavier for them. When one door closed, another opened, though it may not have been in the directions the fans had wanted or expected. After Bungie's departure from Microsoft and Halo, 343 definitely had to prove their worth to fans of the franchise. Whether they have or haven't by this point is entirely up to you to interpret, but that's not what this is about. But instead of leaving the franchise behind, 343 wanted to continue the story of the Master Chief through the years across multiple different games. So in 2010, before Reach even came out, 343 was working on the next Halo game as well as a few others. 343 had about a dozen people in their studio at the time, but over the course of the game's development, they grew up to about 200. This game had people working on it that had all sorts of different backgrounds in game design and game development which planned to help the game succeed exponentially. Considering the previous three year gaps between every Halo game and the fact that Reach released in 2010, people expected this next game to come out in 2013 but people had a couple potential issues in mind. First off, the game was being made by a new studio, which wasn't Bungie. Although 343 were definitely breeded Halo fans, the road to their first Halo game wasn't all smooth sailing at all. Add to that the fact that the landscape of first person shooters had been rapidly 
changing over the past couple of years as a result of games like Call of Duty and Battlefield and people's enjoyment of games like that were changing. Throughout 2010, after the release of Halo Reach and minor divide in the community, 343 wanted to make this game appeal to a much wider audience, which was fairly obvious seeing how the game turned out in the final release. A little bit into development in early 2011, 343 contracted Certain Affinity, an indie studio to help them with the game. Apart from this new game, it's also important to keep in mind the fact that 343 was also developing Combat Evolved Anniversary, a full-on remaster for the original game for its 10-year anniversary. Time passed with different sides of 343 working on different games, and the time came for E3 2011 when people finally got a glimpse of 343's debut project, Halo 4, scheduled to release on the Xbox 360 late the following year, a game that would live in infamy within Halo fans. The announcement itself was pretty well received, but some people weren't impressed. Typically, they were people that were worried about the Halo franchise potentially being put in the wrong hands with a studio that didn't know what they were doing, especially considering the surprising amount of people that weren't necessarily impressed with Reach. There were still, however, a very large amount of fans who were optimistic and excited for Halo 4 immediately after its 2011 announcement. It had been almost a year since Reach came out, it had been four years since Halo 3 came out, and people were generally excited to see what a new studio could do with the games. Besides, by this point, 343 still hadn't given fans a reason to hate them. This was a period that I like to call the calm before the storm, a time where Bungie had just left their partnership with Microsoft and 343 had just come on, but people still weren't screaming at them in anger every three seconds because nobody knew what they could do yet. As 2011 continued, 343 would continue to market both Halo 4 and Combat Evolved Anniversary, and on November 15, 2011, Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary was released on the Xbox 360 to pretty positive reviews. As a remaster, I think it does a lot of things right, but it doesn't come without its flaws. As for things I think it did really well, they toned down the pistol a significant amount from the original, so thank god. My favorite thing this remaster did was have an option to switch visual options on the fly. You can switch between the remastered visuals and the original visuals at just the flick of a button. As my personal first experience with Combat Evolved, it was a good initial impression. What I don't necessarily appreciate as much about Combat Evolved Anniversary is the fact that the art style for the original game is somewhat lost within the remastered visuals. Now sure, you could just ignore all of this by using the classic visuals at all times, which is something that I actually do. I hardly ever use the remastered visuals, but I think that the remastered visuals focus a little too much on looking good, and as a result, in my opinion, the atmosphere of the original game is lost. Especially on levels like the Silent cartographer. I feel like I'm playing a completely different game sometimes because of how different the art style is. As for more good things, the difficulty spike is a little better on the remaster, but then again, that was never really much of an issue in the first place. I always felt like difficulty was extremely well balanced in Combat Evolved because 99% of the time when you die, it's completely on you. Of course, there's exceptions every now and then, like your occasional bug or rocket launcher flood, but for the most part, Combat Evolved has always been an extremely balanced game. After the weight of Combat Evolved Anniversary held people over for a little bit, the wait for Halo 4 continued into 2012. On April 30th, 2012, it was announced that a series of live-action shorts that ran under the title of Halo 4 Forward Unto Dawn would be released to promote the game in the weeks leading up to its release. Famous actor Daniel Cudmore, famous for his roles in the X-Men franchise and Twilight, would be cast for the role of Master Chief. The entire series ran for five episodes, which would release over the course of a month, from October 5th to November 2nd of 2012. The entire series is available to watch for free on YouTube, and I'd say it's alright. It's not that bad, but I think a lot of it could have been way better than it was, and that's pretty much how I feel about Halo 4 in general, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What I'm trying to say is that Forward Unto Dawn was okay, but it definitely had its flaws, especially as far as writing went. Besides that, Halo 4 released for the Xbox 360 on November 6, 2012, and initial reactions to it were very, very mixed. Reach caused a bit of a divide between the community, but Halo 4 split people down the middle and then some. Ever since its release, Halo 4 has pretty much been considered the black sheep of the franchise, and I'd actually be inclined to agree. Out of all the games, 4 is the one that seems most to me like an outsider. The split reactions for this game are something else. They aren't even close to the polarizing reactions of something like The Last of Us Part 2 or The Last Jedi, but they were definitely something. A lot of people praised Halo 4 for its different spin on the franchise and ambition when it came to campaign and storytelling, while others criticized it for feeling forced, boring, uninspired, unoriginal, and rushed out onto the 360. Mainstream critics like IGN and GameSpot reacted positively to the game, but the fans themselves weren't as pleased. My personal stance on Halo 4 comes from a few different places. I always try to keep in mind that this was 343's first full-on original project, so part of this was definitely them testing the waters. That being said, the multiplayer for Halo 4, simply put, is not good. The maps feel dull, the gameplay took a turn to make it feel like your typical more mainstream online FPS, the balancing was all over the place, vehicles fell out of place, it was somewhat of a mess and the player base started to evaporate rather quickly. The multiplayer isn't really what's
what's polarizing about Halo 4, seeing as most people don't really like its multiplayer all that much, the difference in opinion with Halo 4 comes mostly in the form of its gameplay and campaign. I'll say my piece on the gameplay first. I can see what 343 was going for with Halo 4's gameplay, but it mostly just came off lazy to me. This was around the time that games like Call of Duty Black Ops 2 were coming out, and everybody was playing it, so 343 wanted to change up the gameplay to appeal to more casual FPS fans. I understand that change and evolution is something that's essential for games that have been around as long as Halo had by this point, but it could have been pulled off in a far better way than it was. Something I can praise about Halo 4 as far as technical aspects go is the sound design. I love it so much, and I think it might actually be the best in the entire series. The weapons sound so clanky and beefy despite frequent bugs and not feeling very optimized. Add to that the game's shoddy AI, and I feel like it's pretty agreeable that Halo 4 greatly would have benefited from an extra year of development and being a launch title for the Xbox One. 343 rushing it out onto the 360 in two years wasn't a very good decision, and I think it greatly would have benefited from some extra time in the oven. Now, as for Halo 4's campaign, it's very much a love it or hate it campaign, and I'm part of the small minority that doesn't love it, but also doesn't consider it to be a complete hell spawn or any of that sort either. I think the way the writers wrote Chief and his dramatic relationship with Cortana throughout the campaign, as well as Chief's humanization, aren't nearly as good or well-written as some people make it out to be. I think certain points of dialogue and writing aren't super well done, I'm looking at you, thought you'd be taller, but things like the level design and difficulty balancing are actually pretty good. Missions like Infinity and Reclaimer, while not some of my favorites in the franchise by any means, are still pretty good and offer the player some decent replay value. Apart from that, Forge returned and wasn't nearly as well received or good as either of its previous iterations. While I like things like Forge Island and a lot of the customization that Halo 4's Forge has to offer, I don't think at all that it comes anywhere close to holding a candle to Forge in Halo 3 or Reach. It isn't necessarily as in-depth, the fun factor isn't nearly as prevalent, the maps themselves don't feel nearly as fun to customize, in short, 343 really didn't handle it nearly as well. The other new thing about Halo 4 was Spartan Ops, 343's first attempt at recreating Firefight, and I actually think it worked to an extent. The story they made for it, which ties into Forward Unto Dawn, isn't really interesting or attention-grabbing, but the gameplay is fine for what it's worth, despite it being Halo 4 and the gameplay being rather uninspired, especially when it comes to classic Firefight and ODST and Reach. Even today, Halo 4 is a game that has a sour taste in the mouth of many fans, and it has for many years. Not a huge chunk of the community were all that fond of the game or the things it had to offer, and the first impressions among fans of 343 Industries weren't very high. After the release of Halo 4 in 2012, 343 started shifting attention toward their next major project, which would be a continuation of what they had set in motion, as well as a few other things. As a minor homage to Halo 4's story, Halo Spartan Assault was released on July 18, 2013. It was a top-down spin-off of the franchise that focused on characters like Palmer. It wasn't a very good game, but it served its purpose for whatever it was worth. However, 343 had ambitious ideas in which they were unaware of the results. Upon its release, Halo 4 very much caused a ripple between the fandom, but one thing was to be for certain, that 343 Industries was a household name and they had plans. 2013 was quite the year for the series behind the scenes. It was fresh off the release of Halo 4, as well as things like the top-down spin-off Spartan Assault, 343 began working on new projects, which were a whole new Halo game and revisiting past material. Given the fact that Combat Evolved had been remastered for its 10th anniversary in 2011, rumors began to circulate that Halo 2 would attain the same treatment. Microsoft was also finished finishing up the Xbox One at the time as well, and at E3 2013 at Microsoft's press conference, 343 teased the next Halo game which would be playable on the new console. Not much was known about this game, other than the fact that it would be the next mainline entry in the franchise, so that it was going to be Halo 5, and also the fact that it was going to be a system seller for the Xbox One. Throughout 2013, Halo 4's multiplayer player base would begin to diminish a considerable amount, which to many was a reflection of its quality. Either way, fans were hopeful with Halo 5, as well as the rumors of a Halo 2 remaster continuing to grow, fans were optimistic about the future of the franchise, even despite Halo 4's very divisive reception from fans. For the rest of 2013, fans remained at somewhat of a stagnant state with the series in terms of how they received it. The Xbox One officially made its global launch on November 22, 2013, a week after Sony launched the PS4, and while fans were held over by its launch, there were still a lot of people waiting to see what Halo could be like on what was at the time a next-gen platform. With the teaser for Halo 5 that was showcased at E3 2013, 343's general manager Bonnie Ross reflected on the game by stating that the studio was attempting to take a lot of the negative criticism that was given to Halo 4 and use that to their advantage, which only heightened expectations. As 2014 approached, more anticipation had begun 
on to build around 343's next project. Would more Halo 5 news be revealed? Would Halo 5 release that year? Would the long-winded rumors of a Halo 2 remastered finally come true? People were going to have to wait a little bit longer throughout more of 2014 to hear more about it. As more time continued to pass, E3 2014 approached, where a lot more about Halo on Xbox One was showcased by Microsoft and 343. First off, a lot more of Halo 5 was showcased, with 343 revealing a full-length trailer as well as the game's full name, Halo 5 Guardians. Bonnie Ross had already revealed the name and release date of Halo 5 from a blog post she wrote back in May of 2014, but it was still an exciting announcement regardless. Apart from Halo 5's official full-length announcement, 343 also unveiled something that made fans absolutely absolutely ballistic upon its announcement. In order to set an end to the rumors of a Halo 2 anniversary, at E3 343 announced that Combat Evolved Anniversary, as well as Halo 2 Anniversary, as well as Halo 3 and Halo 4 would all be playable on the Xbox One under one disc later as of that year. Campaign, Multiplayer, and Forge all included, and it would be called Halo The Master Chief Collection. This was huge for so many reasons. First off, it meant that Halo 2 Anniversary was actually a thing that would be happening. Second, it meant that Halo 2 multiplayer was actually playable again. The original version's multiplayer wasn't functional any longer after Microsoft shut down the online servers in 2010, so people could finally play it again. Also, Halo 5's beta would be playable through the collection. This was the big four mainline games in the franchise at that point, all released onto one disc on Microsoft's new console. I think it's needless to say that this was pretty fucking big. It wasn't something that was present with the hype for Halo 4 when that was coming out. The rest of 2014 leading up to MCC's release was a pretty painful wait. I remember this. I remember it painfully well. The hype led up, and Halo the Master Chief Collection was released for the Xbox One on November 11, 2014, and needless to say... <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> it was really bad. The first nearly four years of MCC's life cycle are pretty well documented at this point, but for those uninformed, I'll do my best to fill you in. To start off, there was a parade of technical issues that completely curb stomped the flow of all the games. Halo 4's cutscenes would literally crash the game. Gravemind in Halo 2 would make the game literally start eating itself at certain points. In multiplayer, it would always take what felt like the period of an entire century to load into a match. When you do load into a match, it either crashed mid-game, crashed in the pre-game lobby, lagged out the entire match, sometimes even crashed your entire console. Avalanche on Halo 3 would always load in untextured for me. To put it simply, MCC was an absolute train wreck of a collection, but despite that, I'm going to be positive and talk about some of the things I actually really liked about pre-patch MCC, and things that weren't affected all that much by the game's issues. To start off, I would honestly consider Halo 2 Anniversary when it worked, and definitely now, to be one of the best remasters ever made. It fixes the mistakes that CE Anniversary made by making the remastered visuals and audio still fit the atmosphere and art style of the original, as well is also adding its own unique rendition of Forge, making the game just play better, improving the sound design, doing all of this while still managing to recapture the same feeling and energy that the original Halo 2 had that made it so special. It's also worth noting for me that MCC was actually my first impression with Halo 2, seeing as I never owned an original Xbox and the original servers were already shut down anyway. To this day, I've only actually ever played the original version of Halo 2 once. Also, I can appreciate the fact that MCC had always managed to mostly retain the content from all these games instead of just mindly stripping them away from the player. I'm looking at you, Modern Warfare 2 Remastered. Also, a lot of the balancing issues were fixed for some of the original versions of these games. Some of the weapons in Halo 3's MCC version feel a lot more balanced than they do on the original 360 version. Even despite all of this, the Master Chief Collection was still a buggy mess of a game for a very long time and left a sour taste in the mouth of fans, with many fans of the franchise starting to become seriously aggravated toward 343. The Halo 5 beta took place from within MCC starting on December 29, 2014, and ending on January 18, 2015. Also, ODST would be added to MCC in early 2015. Throughout 2015, 343 continued to push Halo 5's marketing, and I'll say this. False marketing or not, whether you like the game or not, Halo 5's marketing and promotional material was really good. Double dog damn, those are some good trailers, and they brought this mysterious atmosphere to Halo that fans had never seen before. Hunt the Truth was a series of audio logs produced once a week in an episodic format that detailed Master Chief's involvement in the story as Halo 5, as well as the involvement of the character Spartan Jameson Locke. 
The first log was released on March 22, 2015 and went all the way up to the finale at E3 2015 where 343 showcased a gameplay demo of the game. Also in 2015, 343 announced that they were working on Halo Wars 2 with Creative Assembly, responsible for the Total War franchise. A second wave of the Hunt the Truth logs came up, going up until the final month of the game's hype cycle. On October 27th of 2015, Halo 5 Guardians was released for the Xbox One, and once again, there's a lot to say about it. For one, Halo 5 launched with a lack of content. It launched without Forge and Split Screen, which was something that was received disastrously by fans. Its four-hour disaster of a campaign was received horribly by people. It was generally seemed to be a letdown of a product by many fans. Forge would eventually arrive in the game in December of 2015, but first off, let me talk about this game because, again, there's a lot to say. First off, the campaign is an absolute abomination in almost every sense. It's a complete disregard for everything the Halo franchise was ever Ever respected for. Literally everything it attempts to do, it fails miserably at. The storytelling is all over the place, the writing and dialogue feels like it was written by a bunch of drunk middle-aged men at a party, the awesome teasers we got from the promotional material of Locke vs. Chief all amounted to a singular poorly choreographed motion-captured cutscene that lasted literally two minutes and ended anticlimactically. The character building of Locke was also really bad. For a character that you unironically spend most of the campaign playing as, he doesn't have a good or relatable character or good enough writing that would typically attach the player, nor does he have the iconic status of a character like the Master Chief. Also, the plot of focusing on Cortana after the events of Halo 4 was an interesting concept for the story, but executed horribly, and it wouldn't have worked anyway because it requires Chief for more than three levels, and you only play as him for three levels! Even 343 themselves have admitted previously that the lack of Chief in Halo 5's campaign wasn't something that they should have done. I wouldn't be surprised in any sense if half or more of the people that wrote the story for Halo 5 aren't fond of it anymore. Across the entire campaign, which is far too short, mind you, I would consider it to be the worst in the entire franchise by far. As for other parts of the game, the multiplayer is a significant improvement to its letdown of a counterpart in Halo 4. To start off, the maps were a lot better. Maps like Rig, Regret, Truth, all of which are better than most Halo 4 maps. Also, the weapons and sound design are still good too. My personal favorite weapons in Halo 5 are the shotgun and the SMG. All of these things work really well. The classic modes like Infected, BTB, and CTF make a return once again as well. I could whine about microtransactions and rec packs again, but it's not like I'll actually care enough about it anymore for it to really seem genuine. The main thing that I have as a complaint against Halo 5 multiplayer is Spartan abilities, and everything that I said against armor abilities in Reach multiplayer can also be applied to Spartan abilities in Halo 5. Another talking point for Halo 5's multiplayer was the armor customization, which is basically the biggest double-edged sword since Darth Maul's lightsaber. The reason I say this is because while it's actually really surprisingly in-depth to the point where that's almost amazing, so many of the helmet designs especially, and armor designs, look like fucking dog shit. Apart from the multiplayer, Halo 5 heralded the return of Firefight under the name Warzone Firefight. It did a pretty decent job to combine both ODST and Reach Firefight with elements of Spartan Ops, and I think it did its job despite being very weird compared to the previous three, I guess, iterations, but it was still very fun, and it's probably my favorite part of the game. I made a lot of fond memories out of that mode in Halo 5 specifically. It might not be the all-time greatest variation of Firefight, but it's still loads of fun and something you can always casually hop into. Moving on to Forge, as as I said, Halo 5 actually didn't launch with Forge, but it was added two months later after the game's release in December of 2015. While Firefight is my personal favorite part of Halo 5, I don't think you would necessarily be wrong to say that Forge is a really good part of it too, and I wouldn't blame you at all if you said it was your favorite. Upon release, Halo 5 Guardians was given somewhat favorable reviews, but much like 343's previous projects, it was still heavily mixed. The campaign was relentlessly trashed by the community, whereas multiplayer and Forge were praised, but only to an extent, where people claimed the Halo franchise was beginning to have a bit of an identity crisis. The best way to describe the game, in my opinion, is that Halo 5 Guardians is an alright game that isn't without its many issues. It probably would have been way more well received if it wasn't a Halo game, and I think you could say the same about Halo 4, but even if those two games came out without the Halo name, they probably would have gotten lost into the jumble of first-person shooters coming out every year. 
Going into 2016, more post-launch content for Halo 5 was coming out, such as maps, game modes, weapon variants, and different requisitional items. Not a whole lot of news related to any other form of spin-offs or new additional games would come out within the coming months besides Halo Wars 2, so players spent the bulk of 2016 working with Halo 5 and its increasing amount of post-launch content. 343 staff Bonnie Ross and Tim Longo had expressed their satisfaction at the success of Halo 5, having sold 400 million copies within its first week of release. Whether you like the direction 343 has taken in the franchise or not, Halo sells. It was still able to do a good job financially against games that also released around its time like Fallout 4, The Witcher 3, Black Ops 3, and Star Wars Battlefront. Even if it's lost its touch over the years to some people, Halo is still a well-recognized brand and it still sells. And so slowly throughout 2016, more information on Halo Wars 2 began to come to a head, which resulted in a trailer at E3 2016. There were two betas for the game, one in 2016 and one in early 2017, and the game finally released on February 20th. 21st, 2017 for Xbox One and PC platforms, and I think it was a pretty fun game. The only question was what was 343 going to do now? After the release of Halo Wars 2 in early 2017, it was somewhat difficult to pinpoint what 343 was going to do with Halo next. Picking up details about the next game ahead of time was relatively hard to do, apart from a few select details. One of these details was the positive confirmation of Split Screen coming back after its notable absence in Halo 5. More content for Halo 5 would continue to release, but that was basically it. Halo was basically left completely untouched at E3 2017, which was fair enough as it wasn't ready. Players would go through the rest of 2017 with an absence of anything related to Halo besides some content for Halo 5 and Halo Wars 2. It's worth noting that Halo Wars 2 didn't sell all that well, even with the Halo name attached to it in comparisons to games like COD World War 2, Zelda Breath of the Wild, Horizon Zero Dawn, Destiny 2, and others, as well as the fact that the long-winded rumors of a possible Halo 3 anniversary didn't end up panning out. 2017 was a very underwhelming year for Halo, seeing as fans didn't really get much out of it. But then 2018 hit. I would consider 2018 to be what was probably the best year for Halo in a very long time at that point. Despite a whole DMCA controversy within Microsoft and Project El Dorito, better known as Halo Online, which was an incident that involved Microsoft shutting down support for a fan mod project that took many of the positive qualities of Halo and put them into one fan-made project on PC, made entirely by a team of modders. More about the next game slowly started to be revealed and teased as 343 continued to work on it, which all came to a head at E3 2018 when at Microsoft's press conference 343 finally revealed the next game. Halo Infinite. That trailer was so nice, it had so many awesome things about it, from the small details, to the environments, to the wildlife, to that helmet shot at the end and the finish, the fight piano as the warthog rides around the environment, god it was so cool! It was also revealed that Infinite would be released on PC, making it the first mainline entry to get that kind of treatment since Halo 2. After this trailer, the buzz about Halo Infinite went up and around the internet, getting up to number 5 on the YouTube trending tab. After this, the hype and speculation about Infinite would continue, but it would be a bit more before anyone else besides 343 would know anything about it, but that's not all. Two days after it was announced to go on Microsoft's Xbox Game Pass streaming service on August 28th, 2018, out of completely nowhere, 343 just shadow dropped this huge patch for MCC that completely overhauled everything and managed to do the impossible fix the game. 343 fixed most of the bugs, all of the game breaking ones, they fixed some balancing issues, also fixed the time for matchmaking, thankfully it used to be absolutely insufferable, I'm so glad they fixed it. But even on top of all this, the coolest part of MCC's patch in my opinion was the fact that after this, 343 just started to regularly patch and support the game, which was great. MCC had gone on for so long being such an absolutely atrocious excuse of a collection of four great games and one mediocre one. It was so nice to see it actually improving. Going into 2019, for the first time in a long while, things for the Halo franchise actually looked extremely optimistic. More content for MCC and Halo 5 would drop in the coming months, and then something extremely important to the future of the franchise would happen. On March 12, 2019, the official Halo YouTube channel uploaded a video simply titled, Announcement. This video detailed two things. The announcement in question would be that the MCC was coming to Steam and coming to PC, which fans had been praying for for years, but also, Halo Reach would be making its way over to MCC as well. Again, people were begging that Halo would come to PC for years, and the announcement that Infinite would be on PC was a glimmer of hope for those people, but MCC sent a whole new wave of hype. 
More about Halo Infinite would come at E3 2019, showing an in-engine rendered trailer as well as announcing the fact that the new Xbox console was scheduled for a release of Holidays 2020 and that Infinite would launch alongside it. As the months of 2019 progressed, fans were still excited but now concerned about the fact that we were a year out from the game's release and there wasn't even any gameplay for it. It also didn't help that Tim Longo left 343 in the midst of development way back in August of 2019. It soon became increasingly clear that Halo Infinite has had a turbulent development. More on Master Chief Collection for PC would would be continuously announced, revealing that the games would be released in an episodic format with Reach dropping first, then the rest of them in the coming months after the fact. And on December 3rd, 2019, Reach dropped on MCC and MCC came to PC and it was awesome. It actually functioned and it worked, which was amazing. Fun fact, MCC on PC was actually what convinced me to make the move from console to PC in the first place. Heading into 2020, more content for MCC would release, but the lack of news about Infinite continued to worry people. 343 saw this and said, hey guys, we're gonna do a gameplay demo of it finally. We know you've been waiting a long time. So a gameplay demo for Halo Infinite was showed off on July 23rd, 2020, revealing many things, such as the addition of a grappling hook, the fact that the game is going to be open world. 343 brought back a lot of classic weapon designs, but even for all of this, it still didn't look like the next generation game for the Xbox Series X that players were expecting. But it's important to know that this game was very much made with the Xbox One in mind. However, people generally weren't impressed, and shortly after, 343 delayed the project to 2021, which... Honestly, that's for the best. Also, Joe Staten returned to Halo in August of 2020 to help with the project, which broke the internet. Soon after, MCC on PC was finally complete when Halo 4 dropped in November. Then, in December of 2020, new screenshots of the game were released with the brand new release window of Fall 2021. With a glimmer of hope for Infinite on the horizon, I, like many other people, hope they can pull this off consistently with a good product at every turn. Halo Infinite is a weird thing now at this stage because it's something that has huge potential but could very easily be squandered. I hope the best for it, I really do, as does everyone else, but it's unclear at this stage how it will turn out. It's gonna sell no matter what, but that's attributed to Halo's brand recognition rather than just being a good game, so I'm not sure. I think Infinite has a lot of intriguing ideas that can make for great game mechanics and ultimately make it a better game, but a lot of the studios, especially 343, have a habit of taking good ideas and dumbing them down to make them feel like less than they are. I actually don't hate 343, surprisingly. I think they're talented and they've done a lot of things for Halo that I'm very fond of to this day, but their biggest issues, the fact that they can take a concept that sounds fantastic and manage to squander it. And that's honestly perhaps the biggest obstacle they'll have to overcome with Halo Infinite. Well boys, we did it. This is finally out, and you've probably seen it if you're watching the end of this- What am I saying? You, you fucking see it. Whatever. If you somehow managed to watch all the way through, I'm proud of you, and thank you for doing that. That really means a lot to me that you watched an hour and 13 minutes of me talking about something. I announced this video way back in November when I first started working on it, and it's been delayed numerous times, and I know that it's taken a long time to get out, so for those of you who've been waiting the whole time and have been patient with me, thank you for that. I'm super glad. Anyways, I'll see you around. Peace.